Thank you and welcome. Um, it's really my honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Nurdin Farrar. This is his last year as the College of Liberal Arts Winton Chair. Um, he's been here for three years. Uh, under that, uh, under the auspices of this endowed professorship, uh, he's taught classes, he's staged two plays, and the um, second one will have another staged reading uh, on December 7th and 8th at the University of Minnesota Stoll Theater in the Rarig Center. There's flyers out there, so please pick them up and, and uh, try and make it. It's free and open to the public. Uh, and he's given a series of public lectures and readings um, around the Twin Cities um, and here at the Loft particularly. The Winton Chair is uh, offered to uh, scholars and artists who break the rules. That's the rule of this chair. Um, and uh, as a Somali novelist uh, writing in English, um, Nurdin breaks rules, many rules. <laughs> so um, that was uh, an easy sell uh, when we, Charlie, uh, came up with the idea of nominating uh, him for it. Um, my first encounter with the name Nurdin Farah came when I found a paperback edition of From a Crooked Rib when I was in the 70s, when I was a graduate student, I think maybe even an undergraduate. Um, and I just figured the, I didn't know this name, you know, so I just figured this author must have been a woman because of the incredibly astute uh, mode by which he understood female, the female condition. Um, so, you know, I didn't even, th you know, I read the novel when I was reading all these women's novels. It was in the 70s. I was a feminist, and that was what we did. Um, and uh, then years later, I ended up being a full, you know, a professor here. In 1987, I was hired. And in 1988, uh, Nura was uh, hired by Charlie, who was then the director of the creative writing program, uh, as the Edist Edelstein Keller uh, endowed lecturer. And uh, so I actually met him because it was his first year here, and it was my second year here. So that was practically a quarter of a century ago. Um, anyway, he was teaching a course on post-colonial literatures, and he, was an, and he included in that a very wide understanding of what post-coloniality was, including the notion that African Americans were a colonized nation within the US. And so he was teaching Toni Morrison's newly published book from 1987, Beloved, a book that is I deeply love, uh, is deeply beloved with me. Well, I can still remember, and I still get goosebumps, thinking about his lecture on the missing number three in the first word of the novel, 124, uh, which is the address uh, that um, Setha and her children uh, live at. Um, and uh, of course, he, he gave a two-hour lecture on the importance and significance of the, uh, of the number three. Um, uh, of course, uh, a number very important to Dante, who figures largely in this book, not to mention Nuruddin, who writes trilogies, uh, many trilogies, three, tril three trilogies, right, so far? Um, <laughs> so there was a way in which um, his deep understanding of literature, his deep understanding of how to be a reader and a critic, I mean, he taught me so much about reading, um, has informs virtually everything that he works on. Uh, he's, the, he's the author of 11 novels, um, numerous essays and works of nonfiction, some of which, um, uh, one of which appeared in, uh, as a whole book. Um, and uh, he's also been writing plays of late. Um, he's probably best known for, uh, well, I don't know, he's best known for everything. So, um, but probably for the novel maps, he's best known for his one word novel uh, titles. Um, and uh, so, uh, uh, so I won't even list them all, but this Crossbones is the final um, volume of the Past Imperfect trilogy uh, that began with Lynx and Knots, um, and I think he'll be reading a little bit from maybe either all three of them or two of them tonight. Um, Crossbones, um, uh, which refers in many ways to the pirates that are kind of somewhat central to the plot of this novel, are also like Nuruddin Farrar, are, is about crisscrossing, crisscrossing from Minneapolis to Puntland to Mogadishu and back, uh, and uh, crisscrossing uh, the, the globe, uh, a globe that gets smaller and smaller to some degree and larger, to lo and, larger and larger to another as people in some ways uh, cannot figure out how to live together, but 
actually absolutely must live together. In any case, at every turn, the heart of this crisscrossing is a return to Africa, and in many ways, thus, those pirates are really Nuruddin who are sort of going out and coming back home uh, to the heart and to, and to the homeland. Um, he was the winner in 1998 of the Neustadt International Prize for Literature, um, but he has continued to garner prize, prizes and praise ever since. So I just want to conclude, because I don't like long introductions, he's going to read to us, um, with the really hot off the presses new uh, New York Review of Books um, review by Pico Iyer, uh of, um, of Crossbones. Uh, I just want to conclude with a, a line from that, a quote from a young Somali man who said something to me a number of years ago in the same room about Nuruddin, and then a little quote from, a little passage from Crossbones before I turn it over to him. So Pico Iyer is writing um, about the novel, and he says, writing in English, his fifth language, he gives us the kind of informed and grieving account of Somalia's impossibly complex tangle of interests that it's hard to find in any newspaper. Yet underneath its journalistic urgency, Crossbones is really about the limitations of journalism and of our ideas of progress. Few of its characters can see beyond their own small orbits. Every identity is slippery and all explanations seem beside the point. Um, so what this novel really investigates is how we don't know and, uh, and how not knowing is a central facet of our human condition. When he was reading here a number of years ago, uh, and the place was literally hanging from the rafters with, uh, with teenagers, he actually got up from a seat, and I was sitting on the floor right there, and let me sit in the seat, and some boy looked at me, a young you know, Somali boy said, you know him? And I said, yes, and he said, he's a cultural icon. <laughs> and I said, I know. Um, he's the only one I know. <laughs> anyway, I just want to conclude with a little passage from Crossbones, which I think in some ways crystallizes this idea that the intensely local is absolutely the, uh, the, uh, the global. No wonder disease, I love this passage also, no wonder disease comes are rich with pockets in which germs find homes. No wonder nations breed all sorts of persons, some of whom will cause the death of their own kind, betrayers, sellouts, subhuman suicides. Politics is a living thing, and you can never tell with living things, Jebla says. Living things kill or are killed. They walk away, they change alliances. They bite, they are crushed underfoot. Lice or not, living things are the darkness upon the face of the deep." Unquote. So, without further ado, Nuruddin Farrell. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. I've often come to the loft to give readings. 1988 was my first, and I'm hoping this is not going to be my last. Thank you for inviting me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read passages from two books the first part of the trilogy and the last part of the trilogy. And what I'm going to do is to show you, in inverted commas, the interconnectedness between the stories. I'm going to take the scene which I'm writing about. It would have been about 1993, although I wrote it much, much later, uh, in which the American Marine who was killed, Black Hawk Down kind of killing, uh, and some young boys drag the corpse in the dusty streets of Mogadishu. I'm going to show two reactions to the same incident. One in, in 1993, 
given by a man who was among the fighters. Who he was fighting on the side of a man in the novel called Strongman South. Mogadishu is divided into two, Mogadishu North, which is led, uh, held nominally by Ali, uh, Ali Mahdi, and Mogadishu South, which is held by Aidi. So the, in the novel, the two characters appear. One is Strongman North, the other one is Strongman South. Now, there's a character who also appears in this novel. His name is Dajjal, nickname, but it becomes his name. He used to be an army officer and was fighting on the side of Aidit. His grandson, not actually his grandson, his grandnephew, but in Somali we don't have grandnephew. It's just called grandson. His grandson, whose nickname is Qasir, because he's very short, appears, and so does Dajjal, in this novel. So these are the two scenes that we will visit. Dajjal is walking in the streets of Mogadishu with Jeble, the principal character of this novel, who is Dantean, specialist in Dante, teaches Dante Italian literature at Queen's College in New York. Dejal led the way and Jeble walked alongside, clutching the candies he had brought for Dejal's granddaughter. Death was no longer in every shadow cast by every wall. When he first arrived, when the Jeble first arrived, he feared being ambushed by an unexpected death and worried that he might die anonymously, killed by someone who did not know him and had no idea why he was administering death to him. We're talking of 19, between 1993 and 1996 in Mogadishu. Since then, he had wised up, coming around to the view that in the Mogadishu of these days, death was seldom anonymous. It had a face and a name, and you were more likely to be killed by someone supposedly close to you or related to you. Gone were the days of random killings. Lately, murderers were more calculating, factoring in their possible political and financial gains before killing you. Was it also Mad Mandelstein who had said that only your own kind would kill you? To elude death of that sort, Jeble had fled to the south of Mogadishu where he was supposed to be an other, and where, here was the irony, he felt safer. The Jal interrupted his thoughts. Jeble is an American citizen, lives, and so he says, are you happy in America as a Somali? Jeble answers, America is home to me, but I doubt that I would use the word happy to describe my state of mind there, Jebla said. I am comfortable in America. I love my wife and daughters. I love them in New York, where we live. I can't help comparing your question with one I, that I asked myself when I got here. Did I love Somalia since I've been away from it for 29 years, he says. I found that question very difficult to answer. Do you love Somalia? Of course I love Somalia. What about a Somali in America? When I think about America from the perspective of a Somali and reflect on what has occurred following the US intervention into Somalia, then I feel that I am in a bind. The Jal took a tighter grip on the ball. He kept squeezing to help the blood in his hand circulate. You, couldn't, you could see that he too was turning a thought in his head, stirring it, agitating it. Something happened that I hadn't reckoned on, Jeble continued. I discovered that I was not saddened by the death on either side as much as I was saddened by the ruthlessness displayed by the young fighters. He watched the flight of an eagle briefly before turning to Dijal to ask, 
What did you think of the Marines and the Rangers as fighters, since you were fighting on the other side, on a strongman's south side? I couldn't fault the junior officers, says Dejal. What about the commanding officers? Dejal took an even firmer grip on the rubber ball, his knuckles producing, producing more prominently and appeared a shade paler than their natural color. My heart went out to the young Marines and Rangers, the said, even though on the night of the 3rd of October, when I confronted them as a fighter on the side of Strongman South, man to man, I gave each of them as much of a piece of hell as I could. But during the hell in the fighting, in the, the lull in the fighting, sorry, I felt as though each of them was alone in his fear like a child left in the pitch darkness of a strange room by parents who were enjoying themselves elsewhere. I imagined them wondering what they were doing in Africa, away from their loved ones and asking themselves why some skinny Somalis in sarongs were taking pot shots of them. I imagined them questioning in their own minds the explanations put out by military spokesmen at, Pent at the Pentagon briefings. But you want to know what I thought of the commanding officers from the majors upwards, including the American in charge? That was Marshall Howe. Tell me. I hoped to God they would be court-martialed and wished them hell and much worse. The jail squeezed the ball as though he might eventually succeed in getting blood out of it. The senior officers were too ignorant to learn, too arrogant. If only they had had enough humility to put themselves in, the, in their subordinate shoes, I kept thinking. Their behavior was loony, but the young Marines and Rangers redeemed themselves with their fighting. They held up well, fought fiercely, and gave back as good as they got. As fighters, there was a major flaw in their character, however. They thought less of us, and that was ultimately the cause of their downfall. You should never think less of your opponent. We were taught this at military school. If you respect your enemy, you can be easier on yourself later, especially if you lose the fight, and it's of high moral value when you win. They belittled the strongman South's militia? Is this what you say? They belittled all of us, fighters or no fighters, all Somalis. Strongman South didn't fight. I was there and he didn't fight. That was to prove the Americans didn't do it. The fact that they belittled the fighters. You're saying the pride can cause one's ruin? A lot of terrible things were done that night and the following morning by both groups, ours and theirs, all in the service of the raging insanity. We had hardly wised up to what was being done on our side when we witnessed the worst imaginable horror in the shameful shape of youths dragging a dead American down the dusty streets of the city. But then I thought, a mob is a mob. And there is nothing you can do about it. Mobs run riot. They are good at that. If they go mad, they do it everywhere, even in America. Was there anything anyone said that could have prevented the corpses being dragged? It all happened so fast, we couldn't have done anything. Even if we had wanted to, we were aware of the mob gathering chanting the usual anti-American slogans. Then before you could say, please, let's not do that, the youths, mostly urchins and riffraff, unemployed, ill-educated, were rampaging my grandson, Qasir, among them. No one was in control. Many of us were too exhausted from the night-long fasting, and we couldn't be bothered. You must remember there were so many deaths on our side, over a thousand by our reckoning. Most of us went straight from the fighting to the burial grounds. We were all out on a limb for all 13 hours or so, fighting to keep death at bay 
and I doubt if we could have raised our voices against what the mobs were doing. I can assure you that we too were shocked. Were you not shocked, Jeble? Jeble remembered seeing the TV scene, the, sorry, the scene on TV. He had thought of the beasts of prey roaming the streets of the city and the countryside, beasts inhabiting the minds of youths. But when answering the Jal's question, he moderated his reaction. I thought of life in death, he said, if that makes sense to you. The mob had already dispersed, the Jal continued. And we heard on our shortwave radio that the Americans were leaving, body bags and all. Some of us would have liked to talk things through. I'm sorry that was not to be. Jebler says, strongman South would not have wanted to talk to the Americans. Of course he wouldn't. Why not? Because he was a spent force until the American in charge gave him a new lease on life by making him a wanted man and placing a reward worth thousands of dollars on his head. Thanks, but no thanks to the American in charge. Jabler remembered the discussion of the previous night and he asked the jail to tell him who in his opinion had fought whom. Americans versus Somalis, was this the fighting? Dajjal explained that Somalis, frightened in their sectarian loyalties, did not see the battle as having been fought between Somalis, in inverted commas, and Americans. The fighting, he said, was between the Klansmen supporting Strongman South and the American in charge. Nothing to do with the other Somalis. Truth was one of the casualties of the war. Do you see yourself asks Jeble, as a man provoked into deadly action when you were fighting? What finally made you decide to dig up your gun and pick it up against the Americans? Were you in rage? Anger had nothing to do with it. Justice did. Were you afraid? I was prone to fear like the Marines and alone in my fear too, but I wasn't in a strange country. The Marines were. I knew why I was doing what I was doing, and I knew where I was, even in the dark. That was the difference between our situation and that of the young Americans. And then the story goes on. Now, I have been in communication in the past three, four weeks with a major who was in charge of the young Marines fighting on the side of the, you know, fighting in confrontation in Mogadishu at the time. We've exchanged no less than about six, seven different emails. I have an invitation to go and see him and see some other people from, uh, what he's trying to do is to gather a few of these people so that we can talk about what happened. And the reason is because the American uh, retelling of the version through and in the form of Black Hawk Down, does not the war, the fighting that took place, any justice. Now I'm going to leave links for the moment, and I will take a scene very similar to this in Crossbones. And this particular scene that I'm going to take in this one, Qasir, the grandnephew or the grandson, is appearing in this particular one. This time, the invading force, or the force that the Somalis are fighting against, are not Americans. We're talking of 2006, 2007, when the Ethiopians invaded Somalia, and when some young people, young Somalis, found an Ethiopian corpse, and what happens and what they do to it is what I'm going to read now. If I can find it. Well, I'm going to set it in context first, and that's what, uh, so that one can follow the logic of what I am reading. 
I'm prepared to answer questions later on, if you wish to. Now, <clears throat> in Mogadishu, there was, there is one of the most complex complexes of a marketplace called Bakaraha, which, uh, um, which used to be used as a storage, mainly of grain and other goods. The Bakaraha, to anyone who has been to the Kasba in Algeria, or any marketplace in the Middle East, or Arabs, you would discover that the streets don't lead anywhere unless you know where you're going. <laughs> and when the Ethiopians invaded Mogadishu, the group that's now known as the Shabab, who were the major fighters, were based in the Bakaraha, market complex. In the market complex, I was there several times, you can usually, you know, you would walk in at nine o'clock in the morning and you would say what you wanted. If you wanted someone's finger, because you needed a finger for some st strange reason, somebody would get it for you at two o'clock in the afternoon. If you wanted a corpse on which to practice as a student of medicine, you go in the morning, in the afternoon somebody would deliver it, provided you pay it. This is the kind of market that Bakaraha is. Full of secrets, open on the outside, revealable, but very secretive. The Ethiopians found difficult to penetrate the Bakara, the secrets of the Bakara. And on this particular day, Malik, who is a journalist, writing for the New York Times, freelance journalist, goes to the Bakara to find you know, a computer piece or some, something that was missing from him. And who is his guide? Previously, it was Dajjal. His, Dajjal's grandnephew is now the person who is with him. On the way to the market complex, they come upon more devastation. Houses destroyed by recent bombing and families sitting out in the open or under the shade trees still standing in the rubble. Qasir explained to Malik that many of the homeowners prefer the inconvenience of slumming it out near their properties to moving out of the camps, where the homeless and the internally displaced are congregated. They come across large groups of people moving in the opposite direction, as though they have seen enough, or whatever it is they have seen. Malik reflects in the old dispensation, when the courts, the Islamic courts, were in charge. The city was, on the face of it, peaceful. Now they drive through agitated movements of men and women running away from something and looking back as they run, checking to see if the trouble they are fleeing is going to pursue them. They discern excitement, fear, and anger everywhere they look. Some of them shout excitedly at each other, heatedly exchanging views. Do you want us to stop? Are you frightened, worried? Qasir asks Malik, glancing at him. Malik shakes his head, and they continue. Soon the smell of burning tires reaches them. A battery of youths and robed men charged with the energy of foment raise their fists and chant, down with Ethiopia. Previously it was down with America. Now it's down with Ethiopia, some shout. Down with the invading Christians. And yet others cry, long live the martyrs of the Islamic faith. Qasir turns into broad dirt road, into a broad dirt road, and just as he finds a parking spot, nearly runs over a man crossing the road with feverish intent. Malik says he wishes he had brought his camera. And then Qasir pulls out his phone, and before Malik can say anything, starts to take photographs of youths nearby who set in fire to a crudely assembled effigy of the Ethiopian Prime Minister. 
He and Qasir walk further and further into the heart of the chaos, watching the goings on with rabid interest. Despite the promise he made to his wife not to be pulled into the abyss, his American wife, get killed and turn her into a widow and their daughter into an orphan, Malik, without regret, moves in deeper, excited to ferret about in other people's heightened emotions, to eavesdrop on their heartfelt sorrows, to listen in on their conversations and intrude on their private and public persona. After all, when one is an MO, one is private in a public space. Qasir says, for them, it's like theater. And what they consider to be a bit of fun, which is saddening. It's also a part of the political show in town, orchestrated to the smallest detail by men sympathetic to the Shabab insurgents. The idea is to humiliate the interim government. Did you participate in the debasing of the corpse of the dead Marine in 1993, Qasir, Malik asks. Qasir does not answer at first. Malik says, I know that the chopper nearly killed your younger sister and rendered her mute and forever traumatized. But did you take part in that heinous act of self-humiliation? Finally, Qasir says, Grandpa Dajjal wouldn't allow me to join the mobsters. Would you have joined your mates if he hadn't? Yes, Qasir says. I would have joined my mates if he hadn't told me not to. I would have expected better of you, Malik says. The way it was put to us at the time in 1993, it was all part of a political show of solidarity to Strongman South, an integral part of a theater performance. Everything pre-rehearsed, taking into account every possible detail, Qasir explains. And then after pause adds, I was young, naive. I'm relieved you agree with this. Uh, this is an unpardonable, this is unpardonable behavior, Malik says. Myself, I've been to many of these pre-arranged demonstrations in Pakistan, in India, and Afghanistan. Initially, they all appear so real especially the bit of theater that involved active participants. My feeling is that the performance we've seen had a rehearsed quality to it. Although all that rehearsal doesn't stop many foreign journalists from being taken for a ride, like hired mourners wailing, Qasir observes. I suppose nothing is free. He recalls the names of giants in his field, journalists and authors who pried into the deeper horrors of the universe and who returned with all kinds of spoil. Malik hopes to do an article about staring into the raw truths of rage. The further he goes into the inner sanctums of the market complex, forbidden to him until then by virtue of his outsider status, the more his heart sickens, though. Qasir, with Malik following behind, is now exchanging high fives with the mate of his who fought alongside him in 1993, now giving the thumbs up to a former fellow militiaman who is making sure that the demonstration doesn't get out of hand and that the disorder is kept to a minimum. Malik chokes on the smoke billowing from the effigies burning and the burning deb debris. Then he and Qasir focus their interest on a clutch of youths in a circle, clapping their hands, dancing, dancing and chanting to a chorus of protestations with the interchangeable terms, Ethiopia, America, Christians, infidels, upstates, terrorists, kill them all. This occurs in a continuous song. As Qasir takes pictures of the youths who pose for him, the atmosphere festive, the mood buoyant, Malik realizes with shock that they are stamping on a corpse in uni Ethiopian uniform. For Malik, this marks the moment in a people's history when sectarian rage may be portrayed 
as national panic. Malik thinks that the cross-section of Somalis has suspended their full membership in the human race because this behavior is unacceptable. One does not debase oneself. One does not debase the dead. Nor if one wishes to preserve the dignity of one's humanity, does one raise a house of worship to the ground, desecrate cemeteries, drag a corpse or kick it while dancing around it. One can understand the rage that inspires a certain section of the populace to behave this way. A rage resulting from the deaths and humiliation suffered at the hands of the Ethiopians. However, Mali condemns their conduct because it breaks with Somali as well as Muslim tradition and departs from the norms of civilized behavior. Too embarrassed to admit to his own fear, he walks away, sorry for the Ethiopian, killed in a war in a country about which he probably remained ill-informed until the moment of his death. He feels sorry too for the Somali youths kicking the dead Ethiopian, an ill-educated, ill-informed lot, as unfamiliar with the concept of respect for the dead as they are with Islam. Blame it on de decades of civil war in which these youths haven't gone to school, haven't lived in homes where there is the semblance of harmony and functionality. Blame it, too, on the current Somali political class who are equally ill-educated and equally self-centered and who behave inhumanely towards others, even when they are dead. Malik's sickened heart, sicker than ever, he feels as if he is complicit in their terrible doings because he cannot find a way to stop them from doing what they're doing. Just before they leave the Pakaraha complex, there is a heavy exchange of gunfire, RPG rounds from the general direction of the presidential villa falling within 100 yards from where Qasir parked the car. The geography of the Pakaraha and the Kasba makes sense only to a native, he thinks. A stranger wouldn't know which alleys end in dead ends and which would lead them to safety. And I thank you very much.